everybody. Uh, I'm Lila. This is Patrick. Hi, everyone. Patrick, nice to see you. Um, I was planning to say that I feel like I know everyone in the room because I, I feel like I know um, uh, a lot of our, the attendees here this week through their work with us on predictive maintenance and industrial use cases. But I'm actually pretty excited to see that there's a lot of you I don't know. Um, so before we start off, maybe it's, it's not such a big group. If we could just do a quick round of the room, uh, just shout out what companies you, you're joining from. Just what, what's the blend of industries and, and who's here? Do you mind doing a quick shout out? Aerospace. All right, so some food, some ag, some aerospace, industrial mining, industrial manufacturing. Uh, there was pharma, oil and gas, uh, power and utilities. So very broad scope of uh, industrials. Um, but I think what we have found working with a lot of our customers across various manufacturing and heavy industry um, customers is actually there's a lot of commonalities despite these really broad range of industries. And hopefully you'll see that you know, what we are doing with our, our products and what we're doing in our, what we call our reliability suite is really what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, is pretty transferable across those different industries. But happy to take a conversation offline or interject and ask questions. We can keep this pretty informal um, as, as we go along to, to make sure that what we're showing is resonant to you and, and we can uh, tailor as needed. So um, <clears throat> I'll just do a quick intro and then Patrick will dive into some of the detail and get really into the meat of what we're doing. Um, show some examples with what we've done with other customers. Um, and uh, again, just you know, ask questions. And we're excited to show off some of our recent development. Uh, so our latest release that uh, has a bunch of features that we've heard over, over the past couple of years, feedback from existing customers, and then what we're doing into the future and our, we're gonna be releasing in the next couple of months. So I'll just kick us off and just orient, what are we talking about today? And really we're gonna focus, as I said, on our reliability suite, which includes three main applications. One is C3I reliability. Holsim talked about this this morning. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, we have uh, another panel tomorrow that I'll be hosting with Shell and Duke Energy and Dow on the, the main stage, also talking about the C3I reliability application. This is our flagship predictive maintenance app. And it's usually where people get started with us because it is really tried and true, it's super proven, highly scalable, and everyone just innately understands the problem of predictive maintenance, right? It resonates with your operations teams, um, you can deploy it on basically any asset type, and you can get rally really, really quickly. What we're doing with the rest of the suite, however, is going beyond the predictive maintenance application and just that core use case. Using the same data, it's often many of the same operations teams, really similar users, and for the most part, there's maybe only a handful, if that, of incremental data sources that you need to integrate on top of what you already have in C3I reliability through predictive maintenance to unlock the value of process optimization for maximizing yield or throughput of those installed asset bases. And then also C3 AI energy management to reduce the energy and utility costs of those same uh, plants and sites. Uh, C3I energy management also tackles carbon emissions. So for those of you who have established carbon reduction goals, tracking against those from a really operational standpoint and not just making that problem associated with the sustain corporate sustainability team, but actually operationalizing it and getting your sites to understand what is their, the carbon impact of their um, energy choices. So the three of these applications work really well in conjunction. We have several customers who are co-deploying them. That could mean starting with one application and then doing a fast follow use case um, to augment that deployed application with, again, all that same data, and then you just go after and tackle the next use case. That's kind of what we call, in, in some of you who may have heard of this, a, a horizontal scaling would be like, how do I scale across all my assets, all my sites for predictive maintenance? And vertical scaling is how do I start stacking these use cases and I can do so really quickly with the, this shared suite model. 
And then we have other customers who, right off the bat from the beginning, they know that they want to tackle two problems together, and so they'll co-deploy two applications. And that's where the flexibility of our UI and all the different things we can tweak in the workflows, um, just the design of our applications make it possible for us to kind of merge, the, merge two applications together in some cases in a shared experience. Uh, so just want to lay the groundwork of what we offer as far as a full suite of industrial operational applications. But again, we're going to focus a little bit more heavily on the predictive maintenance application because that's just generally where people are getting started for value first. I'm really excited to, to showcase several customers, as I mentioned, over the course of this week. Um, I encourage those of you who aren't yet doing predictive maintenance with us, and it sounds like many of you who introduce your companies, it'll be new to you. Get to know the, the established players who are here and with us this week. They're excited to share their stories. Thank you, Wholesome. Thank you, Shell. Thank you, Dow. Thank you, um, Duke Energy and the others who are, who are all here and sharing their stories. Uh, but you can really learn from each other and hear what were the successes? What did they do well in terms of how do you choose which site to get started with? How do you choose when is the right point in time for data readiness? And then how do you win over the hearts and the minds of the people to actually affect your business process to get value? So that's really the benefit of having so many of our established customers here with us this week. Um, some of the benefits, um, just we can Highlight these so you know what you can get after. Um, really meaningful reduction in unplanned downtime. With process optimization, you're increasing yield. Obviously, the 2% number, it, it'll vary by your process and what you're producing. So I say that one with a grain of salt. Um, reduction in energy cost is really real and uh, very, very tractable with energy management. Um, so that, that one typically where your sites, if energy is a really high cost driver for your operations, that could be a really uh, fast way to, to lower your operating costs. And then the combination of deploying all these three things together can drive up the operational productivity, right? You're being able to do more with either lower fuel gas costs or lower um, electricity costs and the same installed asset base. You're just getting more out of those assets. And then the... I was just going to highlight the quote at the bottom. Um, so this is coming from Georgia Pacific, uh, who, again, is a, a pretty large C3I reliability customer. And I just um, I think that it, he, what Steve highlighted here is that you know, there's, um, there's a lot of different approaches to trying to make your industrial operations better. But what are you able to achieve with a solution like C3s, even if you're using something else, is you're shifting from people who are kind of reading the tea leaves and they can sense you know, the, the performance of an, op, of an asset, or you're just doing time-based maintenance and you're really over-maintaining a piece of equipment, um, you're able to, uh, to just make better decisions. And that's what really we're helping people do, is just make the people that are already doing those jobs, help them make better decisions to, to make their assets more efficient. So, Great. Uh, hand off to you. Yeah, Great. absolutely. And uh, like Lila said, I'd love to keep this informal. We'll ask some questions of the audience. Uh, we might call on a few of you, uh, but we want to make this conversational. Lila hit on a couple of key points that I want to start with, uh, the first being the co-deployment of some of these applications together and how that can drive operational efficiency levers and value across different levers. I always get confused with vertical and horizontal scaling, but vertical scaling, so deploying multiple use cases at once. So where I'm going to start is uh, an actual customer example of a customer who's done that with a reliability and process optimization. And uh, another thing that Lila just mentioned is over maintenance. And so what was interesting about uh, this customer is they came to us first interested in predictive maintenance solution via our reliability application. And for them, the uh, thing they were focused on was lowering maintenance cost. Um, this uh, example also brings in process optimization. So we started with reliability, but very quickly we realized there were optimization opportunities. And so we'll talk about how they were able to optimize fuel gas consumption as a part of this deployment as well. So the status quo uh, at many organizations, I think it's a very common story that we see is too many alarms. I'm drowning in alarms, I'm using a rule-based or a threshold-based alerting system, and I have a small number of experts who are actually equipped to process these alerts, and 
that doesn't add up. It's not manageable for them, the number of alerts they're getting every day and the number of people we have managing it. And then when you think about siloed and distributed systems, something we saw with this organization was they were using six, seven, eight systems to process alerts. So one system to look at their time series data, another system for their work orders, another system for their case management, uh, another system for uh, their maintenance history. And so part of the challenge they were having was a small team that's having to process this many alerts and it's taking a lot of time for them. Now when this organization recognized that they wanted to change their maintenance and monitoring strategy, one of the first things they did, and this is also something we're seeing among a lot of uh, customers, is they created a centralized monitoring and technology center. And so that centralized monitoring and technology center, that's those experienced operators, they were tasked with processing these alerts and then pushing them out to the field. But when you're in that situation of a mountain of alerts and not much time to process them, and not friendly systems to be able to help you do that, what you're pushing out to the field can often be erroneous alerts. Uh, Lila, I think you in your past life have experience with this. When you are drowning in alerts, what, what is a typical reaction of someone in that position? Yeah, I can imagine for those of you who've lived this life, either as a process engineer, quality engineer, or anybody who's dealing in the, in the field, my, my daily exercise, 6 a.m., wake up, check my email on my phone, delete. You know, I'd have like, there's a series of, of alerts that I just, completely disregard, right? Because it's all so noisy and all rules-based. Yep, and so we hear that all the time. Um, and I would even take that a step further and something that was a really concrete insight uh, that this customer had and that, that we took away um, was the schedule-based over maintenance. So it's not just that pushing out an erroneous alert to the field is uh, a waste of time or you're dealing with a lot of false positives or having schedule-based maintenance that has people going out to the field unnecessarily when there's not an issue. It's not just about efficiency, it's also about risk. And so what this customer found was, we'll send people out there, they'll open something up, they'll look in it, they'll maintain it, they'll poke their prod. If it was operating efficiently, if everything was good before we did that and it was unnecessary, we've now just introduced risk. Um, we've heard all kinds of stories. One that always sticks in my mind is someone goes out unnecessarily, they open a gearbox, they accidentally leave their glove in the gearbox. Um, there can be silly mistakes, there can be really problematic mistakes, but if everything's fine, you wanna have a maintenance strategy that doesn't mess with uh, those systems. <clears throat> so where did we start with this customer? Um, we actually started in an offshore platform off the coast of Canada with two turbine-driven gas compression trains. And as I said, the focus was on reliability. The interesting thing here, again, was um, these were really high-performing assets, and it was a really high-performing and high-producing platform. Uh, they didn't really have the issue that we often see of, we want to reduce unplanned downtime significantly, we need higher uptime. Their goal was keep our production where it is, but change our maintenance strategy, change our monitoring strategy. And so it's kind of a mind shift that they went through which was we might have some people in the organization that think we are performing at that level because we have the schedule-based maintenance, because we're constantly watching everything that's happening. Uh, but can we maintain that level of productivity going to predictive AI-based alerting? Uh, and so that was a big goal that they had here. Now, as we did this, um, I, I mentioned we started this deployment with them with reliability, and quickly in parallel, we realized there were a lot of optimization opportunities, specifically in uh, maintaining their production levels while reducing their fuel gas consumption. And we'll talk more about that in a second, but for them, it was all about how do I uh, minimize fuel gas consumption or optimize it on a daily basis, uh, because in Canada, there is a high penalty for fuel gas consumption, a carbon tax. So for them, that was another optimization opportunity. And the no-brainer for us in working with them, Lila was touching on the incremental data to deploy that use case. We had started with reliability, we looked at this optimization problem, and we said, okay, what data do we need for these optimization models? We had about 90 to 95% of the data we were already connecting to for reliability. So if you think about a traditional project and the deployment steps you have to go through when onboarding new software, most of those deployment steps are already done for reliability data integration, data pipelines, some of the UI modules, environments, architecture, platform. And so really it was just a matter of turning on process optimization by going and getting 5% or so more sensor data from the same source systems, just we need a few more sensors, um, training and tuning an optimization model, and then 
putting the insights in the UI. So very rapid to, to deploy that, and that's where you start to get to different levers of operational efficiency that are driving value. So let's talk results. Uh, for this customer on the reliability side, I mentioned that they were just drowning in alerts, delete in the morning, as Lila used to handle this. 99% um, reduction in false positive alerts using our AI-based predictive maintenance models in reliability. And then the fact that they were using so many different systems, they were actually able to reduce their alert processing time by 90% from 10 hours to one hour. So this happens by bringing everything together in a single application with reliability and process optimization. On the process optimization side, with respect to the fuel gas consumption and carbon tax, um, what they found was when we did the initial deployment, they were able to optimize the average hourly fuel gas consumption and maintain the same levels of, produ of production and what that led to for them initially was about uh, five million in annual carbon tax savings, and that's how they, they recognized those savings. But as that penalty escalates, which it will over the next several years, by 2030, they're project projecting a $16 million carbon tax savings. So again, you can see um, very clearly in this example that the common foundation of these applications enables customers to deploy multiple of them and quickly unlock additional value. So as you're thinking about how you can scale, uh, we'll talk in a minute about deploying the same solution to multiple facilities, but this is another, I think, no-brainer way to think about use cases that take advantage of that same common foundation. And what we work on and what we will continue to do is design these solutions within the suite to maintain that common foundation, the common data model, the common pipelines, the common modules for workflow and UI, such that it is always rapid for you to deploy any of these solutions. Actually, maybe on that point, does that resonate as the, the idea of going, just starting with predictive maintenance or starting with process optimization, then quickly scaling to these adjacent use cases? You know, quick show of hands, is that aligned with what you're thinking for operationally, or are you guys just, I have one problem, my assets always go down, or I need to squeeze out more yield, and I just really want to solve that one problem? I guess, raise of hands if it's, it's like the, the sweet type story. There's these adjacent problems I want to be solving. Yeah, okay, most of the people. Great. I think, I think it depends on the industry a bit, too. Yeah. Obviously, these are very capital intensive industries. Some may be more labor intensive, more process oriented. Mm -hmm. So it depends on where their savings needs to be. I think that's absolutely true. And I think that's uh, a great thing about this suite of solutions is they're pretty complementary in terms of value by industry. So. You know, if, if it's not capital intensive or if it's not something that's running 24-7, maybe reliability isn't your first problem. Maybe an optimization or yield or quality is your first problem. Um, but as you're addressing that, as we un get to the point where I like to think of it as you've deployed one, that journey to deploying one of these applications is really just moving the starting line for the next one forward. Um, and so there's less work to do for that next one. And then maybe it does make sense to deploy that next one really quickly um, once you've, you've tackled the first. Okay, so I think we've got about 25 minutes left, but we wanna keep some time for Q&A as well. Um, so again, going back to vertical and horizontal scaling, uh, if I have it straight, this would be horizontal. Um, <laughs> I wanna talk about some of our recent features that uh, enable scalability. Um, and for anyone that was able to join this morning and see Marianne in the wholesome presentation, um, I, we didn't plant him there to say those things, uh, but I think it was a perfect segue into the features that we've been building recently um, because we want to enable scalability for our customers. So uh, maybe raise your hand if uh, you have done a pilot with C3 or in the process of doing a deployment with C3. I know we have a lot of new faces in the room, but if you've already done that with one of these applications, okay, keep your hand up if you've ever had the thought, how am I gonna scale? Hopefully all of you have had the thought, how am I gonna go from 10 furnaces to 200? How am I gonna go from 10 sites to global? How am I gonna go from uh, 500 control valves to 10,000? And so we've been thinking about that too. That's what we're constantly thinking about is um, we can get to initial deployment quickly. How do we enable our customers to scale globally? And so what I wanna talk about uh, for the next few minutes is some of those features. The first category of features that we've been developing recently are all around the model setup workflow. 
So what does an end user need to be able to do in an application to allow you to create models, train those models, um, and do that all without any code? What this means is when I go to those next 10 sites, I don't need 10x the data scientists. I don't need 10x the support. Um, I have experts in those locations who understand their equipment, and that's all that is required to develop and deploy models. The next uh, feature that I want to talk about is diagram parsing. So this is more about starting to automate the process of tag mapping. So as you use our reliability application, um, historically you'll see uh, <coughs> our SMEs or your SMEs pulling out PNIDs and doing this process. This will automate a lot of that. And then finally, integrated generative AI chat. And I think for me, this is more about user adoption. So as you go to new sites and new locations, uh, we, can, we can have a conversation about change management at the end because um, that was also brought up this morning. How do you put expertise at the fingertips of the new users to allow them to onboard quicker, to allow them to adopt faster? So I'm gonna quickly show a, sh a few of these features. Um, would encourage you to also drop by our booth uh, either later today or tomorrow where we can walk through these live with you in more detail. On the asset and model onboarding side, the first one I wanna talk about is automated data checks. So this is something we call data validation. Um, in my past, I've had experience deploying or uh, managing projects where we're deploying a data science model or AI applications. And the thing that would keep me up at night is do we have the right data? It's the first question we always get from any customer, any prospect we're talking to, what about my data quality? And uh, I've experienced the nightmare scenario of data scientists are building models for weeks or months and in the end, they're just not performant and we can't figure out why and we start to pull them apart and we realize we don't have the right data. Something's broken in the relational data, we don't have all the time series we needed, we have gaps, we have something incorrect and you have to start over. Um, is that a story anyone has experienced before? Yeah, uh, it's not fun. It's definitely not fun to, to explain to, uh, you know, the consumers of that project either. So with automated data checks, what we've done within reliability is if you want to go build a model within the application, you know, have this whole model setup flow, pick the assets you want to build a model for before you can do anything with a couple of clicks, you're going to have data validation run on these assets. And what this is going to do is it's going to run these automated data checks of which there are several out of the box and they're also configurable for you. And it's going to tell you these assets in green, these are ready to go, go build a model. You can be confident that you have the right data. Those that have failed this check, go look at them and we'll tell you exactly what's wrong. So you don't have the right relational data here. This reliability asset and the sensor data are not connected in the right way. This will make it such that you should never again have that experience of I've built a model and now I, I realize after the fact that I have data problems and have to start over. You're also telling me the other day, Patrick, how this would help handoff between data scientists or between SMEs and uh, could you talk more about how this like, that when you have so many different people or people yeah. turn over on the same project over time, how this can help? I think this whole model onboarding workflow helps with that. Um, and as I go into uh, data set preparation or data pre-processing, we'll talk about this as well. But to answer your question, a lot of times what we experience or what we used to experience is uh, we're living in Jupiter. We're living in code. We're living with multiple people that are having to manage notebooks together. Um, so maybe I've done some exploratory data analysis as a data scientist and I'm confident in what I'm seeing, but I save that in a notebook. I go get to step two of building my model. I go on vacation. Someone else comes and picks it up. They have to go understand everything I did. Um, or I have SMEs trying to interact with things and they say, can you visualize it this way or that way? And I have to go write code to build a report for them to validate the data or to validate what they're seeing in the models. With this, everyone is operating off of the same information. So if we're building a model for a compressor, when I want to go look at that, I don't have to go ask my data scientists for their notebook. I don't have to go figure out what the person before me on the project that just offboarded was doing with their code. I just go to my compressor asset, I look at the validated data, and I see that we're good to go. Or I go and I look at the data set that's been prepared and I can analyze it right there. 
that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, for data set preparation, I'm going to go a little quicker for the rest of these. This is the second step in this workflow. And what this does, <clears throat> again, you're getting out of code, you're getting out of Jupyter. So this does everything from feature selection within the application UI, um, data masking within the UI. So once I've done data validation, I have a raw set of data that's been integrated into the application. I'm not just going to throw that at a model. I need to do some pre-processing steps to get that data ready. So I'm going to be able to, through the UI, select the rules for masking out the time periods when we were starting up or shutting down or not operational. Um, or I could use those for those time periods for other models that I want to build. When I go through these steps, what it's going to do is allow me to define exactly what I want to train on of that data set that I have, exactly when I should be making inferences so that I'm not making uh, predictions when that asset is down, and then I can visualize it at the end. So, and actually throughout the whole process. I just didn't show that in this click through. So now I can see with drag and drop, clicks, um, exactly what the data look like that are going into the model, exactly how I've prepared it. Um, and then at the end, this is stored in the application. So again, if the next person comes around or we build a few models based off of this data set, maybe a few weeks go by, I want to revisit this and try something else, I just come right back to this data set. I can visualize it, confirm it's the one I want, and go build a new model. And the last step that I wanted to talk about was model configuration. So most of your work is done at this point. You have confirmed the data is good. You have data sets prepared to build models. Now you just need to define what you want the model to be and what you want it to do. And so within reliability, we have for years had model templates, uh, model pipelines of various types, but now this brings this all into the UI. So again, I come back, I see the data set that I have, I see that the data is validated, now I wanna build a model. The great thing about this is if I wanted to, I could click once and then click start training. What we provide based on the template is defaults for everything. So the default data set is the most recent one, the default template is there. Um, so what this allows you to do is start training almost right away. I once heard someone say the fastest way to good models is to build bad models more quickly. We're not in the business of building bad models or enabling you to build bad models, but I do think it's a very um, interesting point. If we can get you on day two to a model that's trained on the environment and visualized in the application, then you can do whatever you want. Then you can iterate, then you can see what it's doing, then you can improve it. If it takes to month two to do that, then we're really far behind. And so that's what we want to enable with this workflow is I have models trained and ready to go right away. Now, if you don't want to accept the defaults, you click in, you change the hyperparameters, you change the template, you can do anything that you want. Um, but if you do want to accept them, then you can be training in less than a minute. So Patrick, maybe a, a, something that we don't like to admit at C3 is there's other people, other companies out in the world that um, I've seen many a, a demo video on the internet of um, other, other providers who are trying to solve the predictive maintenance problem and maybe have started working down the path of some of this data preparation and user workflows for modeling. Why is it that, you know, what are we doing here that you think is really different um, about our approach to doing that? I think when you think, when you talk about reliability specifically, um, we have spent years and we are fortunate to have customers like Shell and Wholesome and others where we've spent years developing models together and found, I think, a uh, repeatable and sound approach to the models and to the interpretability that the models provide. So a lot of other solutions out there might, uh, if we think about the default start training that I just showed, it kind of feels like auto ML in some ways. Uh, I just click a button, I get a model, I, I see what it looks like, see if it's good enough. But because we have defined the approach, and because at each step in the approach we have templates, and you can templatize what you're doing, um, you don't have the auto ML problem of it's a black box. So I can accept the defaults, but I can see exactly what they were, and I can dig into any of them. On the other end of the spectrum, if I want to be really hands-on and change everything, I can do that as well. So I think the big differentiator is we have a sound approach that's tested with our customers, and we're able to both provide the experience of, I want to change my models and be really hands-on, 
but I can do it in a simple user interface. Or I just want to select 30 assets, click train, and see what comes out. But even with that, it's not a black box, and I'm able to see exactly what I did. OK. Uh, from a model perspective, I think we have around 10 different modeling approaches. Um, and I'd be happy to show you again at the booth. I don't think I can time it up perfectly in this uh, video. But one of the steps in that model configuration is a table of all the templates. And it gives you a description. It tells you when to use them, uh, uh, when the best time is to use them. Should I use an autoencoder for this? Should I use a virtual sensor for this? Should I use LightGBM for this? Um, and we're constantly adding to that library. Uh, so another, I think, differentiator would be you can still go into Jupyter. And we would, still, we would still encourage that your data scientists are experimenting and doing R&D and trying to develop different types of models. And if you find one that is a different approach that is really useful, then you have a way to just, within the application backend, define that as a new template. You say the hyperparameters, the approach that's used, and everything else. And now, all of that work that they've done becomes just another choice within the application. So now I have an 11th template that I can use uh, that's been validated. Yeah, just to underscore that, you know, this workflow I don't think is intended to be an R&D experience. Um, this is really intended to scale and operationalize AI. So, so the, if you have an R&D team of data scientists who are finding the most perfect model and they're, they're fine tuning it, that's awesome. Let's take it, let's take the model artifact, deploy it in the environment, and then run like wildfire with it and tackle every single asset and every single site. And that's what this does really, really well. OK, I am going to just spend a couple minutes on the last two uh, because I do want to save time for conversation and questions. Uh, I mentioned from a scalability perspective, if we step away from the traditional modeling approach and reliability, and we go a little bit earlier in the process, um, we have asset templates to go along with our model templates. Uh, basically, we prescribe in the application and with our expert teams for this type of asset class, this piece of equipment, these are the measurements and features that we need for the model to understand how it's operating. Um, but traditionally or historically, what we'll typically do is we'll work with a customer and we'll say, how do we figure out where those things are in this process? Well, let's look at a PNID. And that can be a pretty tedious process. Uh, some of the people on our SME team have gotten that down to a science and basically are machines to, to be able to do that tag mapping. Um, but with diagram parsing, we're taking that experience and starting to automate different parts of it. So you can come into the application, select a diagram or a multitude of diagrams, upload that. That'll run for a few minutes. And then at the end, you'll have a parsed diagram and you'll have a match of the text that's been pulled out of that diagram against your sensor IDs, so against the sensor ID data that you've loaded into the application. And what you can do within this workflow is you can visualize where any of the tags were that were extracted. So for any of these lines of text that was extracted, you can click a little search icon and go see where it is in the, in the diagram. And then you can validate whether that's correctly mapped for your asset template. So instead of someone having to go find that diagram, pull it up on one screen, print it out, start to look at their asset template, define it that way. Now you can do all of this within the application. And where I think this goes next is you connect it to, now that's replaying, you connect it to your assets as well. So there's a workflow to just connect it to your assets. Now when I'm getting an alert on a particular asset, I can just pull that PI and ID right up in the application. So I have that visualization of where it is. Anyone have experience with highly manual work looking at PNIDs? ids <laughs> Lila, have you seen any of those recently? Uh, my favorite example is last week at a water and utilities event out in uh, the Bay Area. Where that's where uh, we're based. Um, and we were talking about how do you troubleshoot you know, issues on water lines and when something goes out. And uh, one of the utilities experts in the room, he said, oh yeah, we had a problem about a month ago and we had, you know, the PNID was one that was actually framed on the wall and we had to take it down from the wall, <laughs> I'm not kidding you, take it down from the wall and then look at the lines and try to figure out where the break could be occurring based on the data. 
I was like, well, you know, if you would digitize that, dot, that diagram or just scan it into a PDF and run it through this tool, then you, know, you just type in the name of the, the sensor, the, the metering point, and, and we'd pull it right up. So it definitely is a, a problem that certainly exists for some industries. Yeah. Don't frame your PNIDs the <laughs> lesson. Um, and then lastly, I want to talk about integrated generative AI. You're going to hear a lot about it the next two days. You've already heard a lot about uh, what our generative AI team is doing. And really fortunate to have a really powerful team there that we can take advantage of and integrate their solutions into our application. So if we think about scalability, again, I mentioned this before. To me, this is scaling expertise and user adoption. Um, so now in the application, when I go to an alert screen, let's say we go back to the customer example we had at the beginning, we have a small number of experts that can actually process alerts. Well, when you go to 10, 20, 30 sites, um, you're going to have people that are not as well versed in interpreting the information they're getting from the alert. So now what they can do is within the application, they can see as they can today, here's my top feature contributions to this alert. Here's my failure modes. Here's my recommended actions. But they have an integrated chat experience where they can pull up the chat in the side panel, ask questions of their documents, and get troubleshooting tips. Uh, what do my procedures say? Any document that you've indexed within the application, uh, and coming soon, any data that you've um, tagged for generative AI within your application is going to be leveraged for the generative AI response to tell you additional information about what to do. So I can imagine this helping with user adoption. And also, before I go out to my maintenance team, that remote monitoring team that says, should I be pushing this out to them? Is this really the right set of instructions for them to go open that gearbox? Um, I just ask a few questions about how to troubleshoot this issue that the alert is telling me. And now I'll see uh, plain English responses that help me with that expertise. Yeah, going back to you know, my first life as a process engineer, starting out of undergrad as a 23-year-old tasked with supporting three refineries across North America and monitoring all of their pie process book data and telling them when things were going wrong. My first course of action when I got a phone call from someone on site or I noticed something that looked a little bit odd, I would just run down the hallway, four doors down to the guy that had been, you know, working uh, in that company for 35 years, and I'd say, hey, what, how, do, how would you interpret this? What do you think? And instead, you know, with something like this, you could just ask a question, and it really helps onboard those types of users faster and, and just puts that expertise that really is, is probably aging out of the workforce or it's siloed, and if I didn't know that that person was four doors down and instead they were you know, in, a, in the building next door, I, I wouldn't have had that support network. So um, it just brings that expertise to, to people's um, toolkit a lot faster. Okay, we only have five minutes left, so I think I'm gonna stop there. Um, I don't know if there was a slide at the end, if you wanna skip ahead, that uh, mentions more uh, about We were just this. gonna showcase some roadmap, but okay. I think we're um, okay. Happy to talk about that at the booth with everyone, or at the AI marketplace, sorry. Um, but we have five minutes left. Would love to answer any questions that anyone has um, or have any discussion about anything that we've talked about. Yes? Yeah, so a great, great demonstration, great presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, question on the predictive side, and I'm seeing a lot of examples on the factory or the, the major asset that the company uses. Any on the, the kind of the commercial application side, specifically like for the machines that we produce? So we have tons of IoT data out on the machines and we'd like to track them or they're supporting mines or factories, right? Like, you mean like your uh, installed your asset, uh, you're providing services to yeah, your so, customers? Yeah, so we build thousands of machines and we develop them and, and deliver them to customers. So we'd like to track those machines and come up with predictive maintenance of those. So mm -hmm. examples of that? Yeah, there's a couple. Um, I saw... Yeah, Nikhil, you're in the back of the room. So we do that with Baker Hughes a lot. I don't know, you want to talk about the TPS services model? Yeah, I think the launch capital to the Baker Hughes would be the easy one. We have too many oil and gas customers almost all. And uh, then we deploy launch capital to put back in the deal. Uh, there's a lot of instrumentation and sensor data that gets pulled out of these machines. And through our partnership with CT the last four years, we have absolutely capitalize on all that data that comes off of the machine so we can do better sort of safe maintenance and make that operations better in that field. And uh, one of the key things is that if they could use domain expertise and you have your own domain expertise you really combine the knowledge of that machine, the physics behind that machine with the data and the AI, then you go above and beyond just condition monitoring or doing condition based maintenance. So adding 
based on your business model, you've got to figure out how you actually capitalize on it. Excellent. Great. Yeah. There's a couple other examples like that, but there, I think Baker's probably doing it at the biggest scale with us right now. Yeah. So, so you mentioned in your example, um, you know, a, a centralized monitoring team that was perhaps overburdened, right? And even they were having a hard time keeping up with um, the alerts they were getting. Um, what, what do you, do you have a recommendation for a resourcing strategy? Uh, what does it take for a customer to be successful with um, what I suspect are already pretty overburdened site resources? Well, just to clarify, when Patrick gave that example, that was their old tool. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with the, the AI Step one is deploy C3 AI reliability so they're not so burdened. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I think that actually is, is a really <laughs> important point though, right? If you're generating 100 alarms per day with a rules-based system, then yeah, you're gonna have a major resourcing problem. What we've seen with most of our customers though, with the central monitoring team, doesn't need to be huge. Um, I don't know, Graham, how many people are you guys using in your central monitoring sites? The Tau engineers. 25 to 30 across all of Shell? So, so I do think you can have a pretty small, efficient team um, with the right tools, as long as the, you're getting the number of alerts down, the accuracy of those alerts down. Right. But, but you do recommend that as a best practice? I would, yeah. We had a long discussion about it with a group of about 20 of our um, widely adopting reliability customers on Tuesday. And that emerged, I think, across the board as one of the winning strategies that people highlighted is creating a, a central monitoring team where you're combining the digital groups, so that's data science and data engineering, with people from operations. And maybe it's not the, the operations folks' full-time job, but it's some representation so that they're providing that feedback and helping cultivate a, the workflow, the business process, the machine learning models and the accuracy. So getting those two people together in the same kind of central group and then having that same core group end up being the users that adopt the application so that they really understand. They, they put the, their own brains behind these models and they understand how to interpret the alerts and then they can advise out to the field and provide that expertise. It really lowers the change management burden. You know, you're, 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 they're following a process, they're using the applications they're using and so when you go to the next site, you're just onboarding a new site for them. You're not onboarding a whole new set of users to use the application in the same way. Uh, and it's really helpful for us, selfishly, like Baker, for example. They have their iCenter TPS centralized teams that are using our application every day, so we get amazing feedback from them uh, in terms of how it can be improved. And so I think both of those are really beneficial. That said, we do have customers who deploy this out to their sites, and they have site-level users. But then at that point, it's probably not a huge number of users per site. Any other questions? Yeah. Are you doing anything with PLC integrated command and control on manufacturing lines or your process optimizations? Um, I'll, I'll start and then you can yeah. tell me where I'm deviating. Uh, <laughs> So right now we're not. We have some customers that are working towards that. The reason we're not is um, twofold. Not, it's not technology. Like, there's nothing stopping us from doing it. Um, but one is IT is very, very protective. Because once you get into the control layer, then you become a cybersecurity risk. And if something goes wrong or if you lose connectivity for any amount of time and then the, the plant goes down or the line goes down, like IT just doesn't want to mess with it. So they're really, really protective of anything um, that is not uh, kind of a, a, in the historian layer, the cloud layer. Um, and then the second is, is user adoption. And people are worried about what it would mean to disrupt their uh, process control loops. So they're really comfortable, like process engineers and control engineers are really, really comfortable with the APC layer that's been around and technology's been available for 30 years. Um, and so getting them to trust that actually what you could do is over have, keep that control layer and keep your APC. It's just when there is a new optimized set point or a new optimized um, parameter, then override, go into manual mode or go into kind of a, a uh, you know, change the set, set point um, programmatically, but in kind of manual mode. Um, 
And so there's nothing stopping us from doing that, but people still, we find with our process optimization customers, they're more comfortable having a person review that recommended um, process parameter and then go and either phone the operations board or like, you know, uh, adjust it manually themselves. Yeah. Fair? Yeah, fair. Question, where do you see the transportation industry going with this? I see you guys with the military side, I'm familiar with that side too, but what about commercial air, buses, fleet management, how's that work for you? Are you seeing that exploding or? We're seeing more and more uh, use cases in, or customer interest, I would say, in aerospace. Um, and uh, actually, train transportation is another big one. Um, I think, like any other of our kind of AI use case scoping and validation questions, it's are they producing data? How frequently? And can you make a prediction off of that data? Can you, can you have an insight off of that data? So I think there is a lot of opportunity in the transportation industry for predictive maintenance. Uh, the aerospace and defense customers that we have, um, we've also worked on fleet management with them. So I think that is another big opportunity where uh, being able to look across your fleet and go beyond just, am I gonna have an issue, predicting an issue, but also if I have a mission, for example, that, that needs to start, how do I manage my fleet based on where I'm having issues and where I'm not? And I think also the autos are, are installing a lot of this themselves. Um, so if you think about like, I don't know, the, the trucking industry, um, I think uh, a lot of the truck OEMs are installing their own sensor monitoring and then they provide the, um, the services to their, their fleet customers. And then from a consumer standpoint, you know, my car is a computer. Uh, I got a, a new, one of the new electric Ford mach -E's and um, I can't troubleshoot anything on it and I have to use the app, right? And it'll like give me warnings. So I think a lot of that is already being adopted by the auto industry themselves. Okay, I think we're at time. I'm gonna say I'm thank kinda. you. <laughs> yeah, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, welcome to Transform if that hasn't been said already uh, and come find us at the AI Marketplace. We'd love to dig into these features in more detail with you. Thank you. Thank you.